Hello, my name is Jean Stern. I'm the Director Emeritus of the Irvine Museum and I want to thank Eric for giving me the second opportunity to be on Plein Air Live. Today I'm going to talk about the Hudson River School, but first I want to start with just a brief re review of what plein air painting is. In this slide you can see there are three items. There's an animal bladder, there's a glass syringe, and there's a collapsible paint tube. Well, the collapsible paint tube was invented by John Rand, an artist uh, working in London, in, invented in 1841. Prior to that, um, paint had to be made. Uh, you could not just go to the, buy, the art store and buy a tube of paint. So the earliest way to take paint out of the studio was to put it in a little animal bladder. It was usually a pig bladder or sheep bladder and it was uh, in effect like a balloon. Uh, you made the paint, you put it in the bladder, you sealed it tight and you didn't open it or puncture it until you were on site and you were ready to paint on plein air. And then later on, in 1840 roughly, uh, somebody invented the glass syringe, which also kept the air from coming in as you were pushing the paint out. Uh, the problem is being outdoors, um, you often tend to drop things, and if you drop this syringe, it would break. So finally, in 1841, uh, the invention of the collapsible paint tube, which is the tube that we use today. So I want to talk a little bit about the art style called Romanticism. And Romanticism uh, was a European art style that developed in, in the early 1800s. It was aimed at glorifying uh, nature and um, the history of, of humanity. Um, its setting often shown in a wild or natural setting. It, it was not an urban type of thing. It often displays the power of nature like a storm or some other um, force of nature, like wind. And uh, it, it is compared to the human presence. The nature is large, uh, the human presence is small. And there was a strong emphasis on emotion, uh, usually on, on awe and fear and being outdoors among all these um, terrific forces of nature. And it, it put the human presence as an individual against uh, these natural presence. So it's a very, very uh, emotional style. This first developed in Europe. Um, in, in France, this is a painting by Theodore Jericho and it's a good example of French Romanticism. Um, the story is um, that a ship wrecked and the survivors were able to build a raft and they were uh, alone on the ocean for several days and several of them died, but eventually they were rescued. And if you look carefully in this painting, on the horizon there's a little tiny mast of a ship that's coming to pick them up. So this, this is a good example of French Romanticism. Romanticism was also very popular in, in Germany. This is a painting by Caspar David Friedrich. It's called The Sea of Ice. And it is a terrifically powerful painting with a lot of jagged edges. Uh, not a lot of warm colors. It's very cold. It's, it's a field of ice and it has crunched the boat that uh, people came in. You see the red arrow points to the boat and the boat has been completely wrecked. So this is again the power of nature as opposed to the human presence. This is an English uh, romantic painting. It's by James Turner and it's called Snowstorm at Sea. Um, again, you could just barely see the human presence and it's in serious trouble. There's a lot of powerful forces coming on that little ship that's stuck in the storm while they're at sea. So, talk about the Hudson River School. Uh, it's a name that was coined in the late 1870s, even though the, the school began to be active uh, in the 1820s, 1830s. But it was coined in derision. It was mocking that these people went to the same place and painted essentially, according to this critic, to the same subject. But it was the first true American school of painting. This did not develop in Europe. It was not brought in. It, it started in the U.S. and it was developed in the U.S. 
Uh, moreover, it's the first group of plein air painters active in the U.S. So uh, hooray for them. They started this long tradition of which we're in now. Uh, it was a group of artists, um, New York artists, that decided to go to the wilderness. And to them, the wilderness was to go up the Hudson River and, and to paint the scenery, the lakes, the mountains, um, the Catskill, the Adirondack, and the White Mountains, and many other features up the river. It was also, in a way, the first environmental activist in the U.S., because it showed nature at its purest. It, it, it had man uh, not a, able to affect nature, so it, it was a strong statement about, about the power of, of nature. The Hudson River School is divided into three generations. Uh, the first generation um, was um, founded by Thomas Cole, who was um, generally credited with, with founding the Hudson River School. And then uh, his close friend, Asher Durand, was part of that first generation. And another friend, uh, Thomas Dowdy, um, were part of that first generation of artists. And these were active in, in the 18, late 1820s until the, the 1850s. Uh, Thomas Cole was born in England, but he came to the United States when he was 17. And he trained as an engraver before he became a painter. And his paintings, as you can see, uh, they have a strong, powerful sense that nature is dangerous. Nature is powerful. Nature is out to get you. So this is a scene of Niagara Falls, which enough uh, by itself, Niagara Falls being such a terrific, strong, natural wonder. But he uh, puts the scene in a cloudy sky, like a storm is coming. This is painted in 1830. Another painting by Thomas Cole, it's called The Tornado, um, painted in 1835. Again, you see the, the landscape, and there is, there's one little figure there in, in, in that middle tree, the, the middle left. There's a small little figure trying to take shelter behind the tree because there is something very, very powerful, a natural force coming and um, it's something that this person is very concerned about. And this is a, a beautiful daylight scene, although you can see Cole liked to bring in this nature that's you know, threatening. In this case, there's a rainstorm coming our way. It's called the Oxbow. It's on the Connecticut River. And an Oxbow is where a river makes almost a complete circle, but it continues uh, flowing. So it, 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 it's really an interesting formation. So um, this is a wonderful painting, not only in its, in its beautiful statement, but it also um, tells us that these guys were really plein air painters, and here they are. In the foreground, there's two little tiny figures. The human presence is very small. But one of them is, is an artist that's painting outdoors, uh, probably Asher Durand, his friend, who went painting with him many times. And then the other one is a, an abandoned um, setup where the artist has climbed up the hill, uh, Thomas Cole, and is, is essentially painting the view that we see. So they were plein air painters. They probably had to take those little bladders, but they were able to do it and, and it worked out very well. Um, most of these are sketches that were later developed as larger paintings in the studio. The second artist is Asher Durand. Uh, he too uh, worked as an engraver before he took up painting and he was very good at doing portraits and he was commissioned to do uh, portraits of some of the early presidents of the United States and those were later used in U.S. stamps. In 1847, one of the very earliest series of U.S. stamps had presidential portraits and those were engravings by Asher Durand. This is a wonderful painting called Kindred Spirits. It was painted by Duran in 1849, and it shows two of his friends, uh, William Cullen Bryant, the poet, the very romantic poet in terms of nature and, and its beauty. And then also next to him, wearing the coat, the red coat is Thomas Cole, who had just died the year before. So this is a memorial to his good friend, Thomas Cole, and he puts him with another important 
figure in, in this period, that's the poet William Cullen Bryant. Another Asher Durand, this is very typical of, of a lot of Hudson River school paintings from the first generation. It is a nice, tranquil, pastoral scene in the forest, the trees, there's some people, and the people are very, very small. They're not the subject of the painting. The subject of the painting is the nature aspect, the trees, the land, the sky. Thomas Doughty, the third of these early members um, of the Hudson River School, uh, also a very romantic uh, painting. Here you see a painting of his of hunters in the woods with some dogs, and you see that they're, they're very small in the wilderness and there's a big storm coming. Another Thomas Doughty, a landscape, uh, again, a very small human presence. The human presence is very hard to see in this painting, but the power of nature, the rocks, the, the waterfall, the, the storm that's coming, very evident. Now the second generation is, is a larger group of artists that uh, were really moved to paint in the wilderness, to, to go not only to the Hudson River Valley, but also eventually to go to other places uh, to paint the wilderness in the West, uh, even in California, we'll see some of Yosemite. And they are also um, very romantic in terms of, of their settings and, and the skies and, and the reflections on the water. Uh, Bierstadt was a German-born artist. He came to the U.S. when he was only one. His family moved to the United States. Uh, but when he was older, he went back to Germany to study at the Dusseldorf Academy. And the Dusseldorf Academy was a very popular art school in Germany that, that focused on the romantic, German romantic style of painting. So a lot of power, powerful landscapes, uh, uh, human presence is small, but the, the presence of nature is quite evident. And one of the aspects of the, this third, second generation of of the Hudson River School is a style or an approach called luminism. And it has to do with light, luminous luminism. The term was coined in 1954 by John Bauer, who was a curator and later the director of the Whitney Museum of Art in New York. So it, it was a term that was coined um, almost a hundred years after, after the luminism became a part of, the, of American art. It also refers to landscape painting, but it focuses on the effects of light. And the style was very popular in the 1850s up to the 1870s. One of the things you'll see is that the style emphasizes silence and tranquility. It often shows a calm, reflective water with a soft, hazy sky. It has very strong emphasis on aerial perspective, meaning it shows the depth of the scene, not by having lines, but by varying the intensity of the atmosphere as an object is farther away from the viewer. So that's uh, showing the depth of the painting by, by showing the effect of the haze and other things on objects as they get farther and farther away. And another key aspect of luminism is these artists like to smooth out their brush strokes, so they look very, very photographic. Here's an Al Albert Bierstadt, and you can see the luminous aspect of this painting. Uh, there's reflection on water, there's a strong aerial perspective effect. The trees are all the same color, but as they go farther back towards the horizon, they get softer, they get less focused, and they change color because of the effect of the haze. And the farther back they are, the more haze affects the color of the tree. But the foreground is nice and clean and sharp, and it's also a very polished uh, painting. It, it is not free with brush strokes. The brush strokes have been carefully smoothed out. Later on, Albert Bierstadt becomes very famous for his Western paintings, his travel uh, to the West, to Yellowstone, and to Yosemite Valley. Uh, this is one he did in 1868 of the Yosemite Valley. Again, it has all the aspects we talked about, the reflection on the water, the beautiful soft light, uh, the rocks are going deep into the distance uh, because of the atmospheric effect that affects them. Frederick Church uh, became famous and a su very successful artist 
in the U.S. He was quite popular. He was probably the most popular American landscape painter of his day. And he also painted in the Hudson Valley and painted in upstate New York. And then later on, he traveled uh, quite um, widely and did a lot of paintings, as, as we'll see in, in Ecuador, in the Andes Mountain. But this is, this is the Hudson, uh, Niagara Falls. And it is, again, the very powerful subject. Uh, there is no human presence here. Um, and it is, it is just this great, powerful aspect of nature. Here's one of his later pieces when he was traveling. In this case, he is in Ecuador. He uh, paints several views of this uh, volcano called Cotopaxi. It is the highest active volcano in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, many of his paintings show the volcano dormant, but also his most powerful, his most romantic paintings show the uh, volcano in eruption. And by erupting, it, it kicks up a lot of atmospheric material, which affects not only the distance, but also the color. Jasper Cropsey uh, was originally trained as an architect, and he practiced for a while, but by the 1840s, he became a full-time artist. And uh, this is a, a view of Lake Ontario, which is in upstate New York, painted in 1857. Um, Hudson River painters, beautiful, big landscape, this is quite different from the first generation because the first generation would have a storm coming or something. But this is very tranquil. It's a sunset and there's light reflecting all over. Uh, here's a later piece. He was a little more impressionist. Uh, by this time, you could see the brush stroke. You could see the, the thick, active brush stroke. And again, but it's a very similar scene. It's, it's a sunset with lots of brilliant colors. Robert Duncanson is a wonderful artist. He was um, born of an African-American mother and a Scottish-Canadian father. So he was African-American and um, Canadian at the same time. He was self-taught and he was active early on before the Civil War. And as such, he lived in the North, so he was safe. But he, he was involved in a lot of ab abolitionist events. He wanted to help. He wanted to be of use, and he used his fame uh, to do that. He became quite nationally known and even international uh, presence in the art world. This is a um, painting called The Blue Hole in Little Miami River. It's not in Florida, it's in Ohio. There's a Miami River in Ohio, and this is one of those scenes. Here's another Duncanson, a landscape with a rainbow. Again, quite different from the stormy, powerful skies of the first group of artists. This is tranquil. Um, there's just a lot of beautiful light and a lot of beautiful landscape. There's a very small human presence, which, which is typical of, of Hudson River painters. This is by Sanford Gifford. Uh, Gifford was trained in New York at the National Academy, so he was trained properly, really knew his painting, and um, he was active in the Civil War. Uh, he actually served as a corporal in one of the state militias, but he wasn't active in terms of battlefields. So this is 1864. He's painting on Mount Desert Island, which is in Maine. And again, this, um, this is a, a painter, actually. Uh, one of his friends who went painting with him, and um, they're painting this beautiful view of, of, of the island and the coast. Um, this is by uh, Sanford Gifford, again, um, and it is sunset on the Palisades, this ridge of mountains. Uh, it's called the Palisades, and it's on the Hudson River. Very tranquil scene, very calm, lots of reflection. The paint is perfectly smooth here. Uh, there's no brush strokes that stick out, but it, it creates a very mirror-like, a very calm and, and luminous effect. This is by Eliza Pratt Gretorex. Uh, she was one of the few women artists in, active in the Hudson River School. Uh, she was born in Ireland. She came to the U.S. and she studied with the two Hart brothers, James Hart and William, William Hart and James McDougall Hart, who were very active in, in the Hudson River. And uh, she was very 
good artist. She was well recognized. Uh, she was the second woman named as an associate of the National Academy of Design, which was a very high honor. And after 1879, she decided she, she'd rather live in Europe. She lived in Paris, but she traveled all over the world. She returned to the United States, but she, her home was actually in Paris. This is by Martin Johnson Heed. It's called Approaching Thunderstorm. And Heed uh, was well known for his marsh scenes, which this isn't. But he liked to paint uh, marshes with, with trees and, and plants and various times a day. And then he uh, painted a lot in the Hudson Valley, like this painting here. And then later in his life, in 1883, he moved to Florida. And in Florida, he changed his subject matter. He began painting more still lifes, and especially paintings with flowers and birds. And the birds were very popular. He loved to paint hummingbirds. So you'll see a lot of hummingbirds with orchids uh, paintings. That's Martin uh, Johnson Heed. Here's another Heed, uh, a later piece. And it's uh, a brilliant sunset with an evening storm coming. Uh, John Kensett uh, was one of the really true dedicated luminous, as you can see by this painting, uh, Lake George, painted in 1869. Very smooth surface, the, the brush strokes are all covered up, and there's this gorgeous clean light, and the atmosphere is this beautiful haze that, that creates this wonderful sense of depth, and the whole thing the sky and, and the hills are reflected in the water, which is quite calm. So it's a very gentle, a, a very uh, calming scene. Uh, he was also trained as an engraver. Um, in the early 1800s, uh, engravers was, were very popular because they didn't have photography. So any kind of reproduction in magazine, newspapers, or banknotes or stamps, they had to be done uh, by engraving. So, and then you learn how to draw. And you can see by this painting that the artist was, was excellent at drawing and, and everything is just spot on. He was one of the um, founders of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So he was, he was well accepted by society. There's another cancer. This is quite different. This is very luminous because there's hardly any subject other than the light. There's a little bit of the ocean and a little bit of the sky at the top, but by far most of this painting is this gorgeous sunset that's changing in all sorts of colors as it goes through the clouds. And this is by Worthington Whitridge, another very important artist of the Hudson River School. It's a landscape with a hay wain. A hay wain is an old name for a hay wagon. So that's what it is there, almost in the center, there's a hay wagon. Uh, painted in 1861. He was born in Ohio, and he started out as a house painter and a sign painter, and then he became a portrait painter, but he really took to landscape painting. And he went to Dusseldorf, uh, the school that's very much rooted in the German Romantic view of the landscape. And he studied under an artist named Emanuel Leutze. And if you've ever gone to the Metropolitan Museum and you've seen that huge painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, that's by Emanuel Leutze. At the time Leutze was painting this painting, uh, Whitridge was one of his students, so he appears in the painting, he posed. And he posed for none other than George Washington. And he posed a second time in the painting as one of the uh, um, steersmen in the back that's, that's guiding the boat. So a very interesting artist. Uh, in 1865, he and two other friends, Sanford Gifford and John Kensett, both of Hudson River Luminous, they decided to travel. They went west, they crossed the plains, they went all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And those paintings that, the sketches they brought back, they created some very beautiful paintings, uh, one of which uh, is, is hanging in, in the White House. This is the one that's hanging in the White House, crossing the River Platte. And it was painted in 1871. It shows a Native American settlement and some people uh, watering the horses and, 
And uh, it's all set in this gorgeous landscape with the Rocky Mountains in the background. The third generation, um, it's not a, absolutely as set as the Luminous, but it is called the third generation. Uh, there's several artists uh, that later became very well known, uh, people like George Innes and Thomas Moran. Um, so this is by Julie Hart Beers, um, one of the few women, again, Hudson River painter. She was the baby sister of those two Hart brothers uh, that trained Greta Rex, uh, William Hart and James McDougall Hart, and, and, and they trained her. So she got some very good training and you can see that she's very, very well uh, in handling the light, the forms, the structures, uh, a wonderful artist. And these are works by the two brothers, who was also Hudson River painters, James McDougall Hart and William Hart. So um, the whole family were painters. Samuel Coleman was born in Maine and as a child, uh, the family moved to New York because the father had a bookstore and he opened a bookstore in New York. So he grew up around some, some books, some intellectual people. Um, in 1854, Coleman uh, opened his own studio in New York and uh, he traveled widely, went west, also went to Europe. At one time he spent four years in Europe. This is Storm King on the Hudson. Storm King is the mountain that's off to the center right and it's under the clouds and it's, it's raining, Storm King. This is one of the most interesting paintings of the Hudson River School because if you look at the right side, it's all nature and it's all just a human presence. Um, but if you look at the left side, it's modern development. They're going to dredge. They're going to do some alteration to the river. So it's a statement of, of uh, the nature is being changed. It's being attacked by by people and it's going, not going to be the same. So this is that aspect of, of env environmental activism that I mentioned earlier. Here's another different uh, Coleman. This is one of those quiet Hudson River paintings um, done in 1867. Uh, very wonderful, very much in keeping with the tradition of the Hudson River School. Uh, perhaps the most noted artist of this third generation is George Innes. And George Innes um, became perhaps America's best known artist, um, very popular. He too started out as an engraver and learned to draw. And uh, he later he went to Europe and was very much swayed by the French Barbizon painters. And they were an outdoor school of painting, um, but they also uh, were interested in nature. They actually uh, painted the trees they saw. They were one of the earliest plein air uh, painters. They influenced the, the French Impressionists in a great way, but their brushstroke was not polished and smooth. Uh, they liked a very active, a very, very quick and thick brushstroke. So that's how they differ from, from the Hudson River School. This is again one of those environmentalist approach uh, he paints the nature that's being completely changed. There's a whole series of trees that have been cut down in the foreground. There's railroad tracks, there's factories, there's houses. So it's, it's the change that's coming. And this is in 1855. That's quite early for this, this type of awareness. This is a little bit later. It's called Peace and Plenty. And uh, it shows the opposite. This is the human presence, albeit small, but very productive and, and very happy in working with nature and blending in with nature. And this is the artist Thomas Moran. Thomas Moran um, is best known for his paintings out west. He accompanied several of the mapping exhibitions that took place after the Civil War. Uh, he was there with the Yellowstone expedition and later caught up with the Grand Canyon expedition. And uh, having an artist on an expedition was very important because you had to, if you were the, the explorer, you had to show the people in Washington, the lawmakers, uh, what this looked like and why it should be protected. So they always had a photographer and a painter. Originally, it was just a painter back in the 1820s or earlier. 
But uh, as photography became better refined, they took both. And why would they take both? Because at the time, it was only black and white photography and the painter used color. So they kind of uh, helped each other. The, the photographer proved to the Congress that this spot like Yellowstone or like the Grand Canyon actually existed. And then the artist showed how beautiful it was. Because if you just saw the, the a painting of, of the Grand Canyon, you'd say, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. But the photographer, uh, you look at the photo and you say, well, yeah, it is there and look how beautiful it is. So that's one of the importance of, of um, the artist um, going with an expedition. Uh, later on, Moran uh, lived in Florida for a while and painted these gorgeous Hudson River style paintings, but they're in Florida. And then again, uh, perhaps what he's best known is, is for these uh, paintings of, of the national parks before they were national parks. Uh, they would paint uh, these, Bierstad, Moran, they would paint their sketches on paper because they didn't have wagons and if they had the wagons they didn't have the roads. So they had to get on horseback or muleback so they carried paper. And they did a lot of sketching on paper and then later when they went to their studio they did their, their big major work. This is the artist Francis Silva uh, who is an excellent luminist. You can see by this painting um, Barnegat Beach is in New Jersey. Uh, but he was also very active in the Hudson Valley. But you see this absolutely gorgeous sunlight reflecting at sunset, all sorts of objects, a very smooth surface and um, just remarkable use of light. Uh, here's another Francis Silva, a little different because it's, it's not that sunset with all that bright light, but it's a very subtle but very well-developed light. It's uh, the Hudson River at the Tappan Zee. The Tappan Zee is a spot in the Hudson River where it gets quite wide. And the word Zee is, is German for sea. So it was like a small sea right in the middle of, of the river. So, is there still artists painted, painting this way? Is luminism still alive and well? And the answer is yes. And I'm just gonna show you just a few examples because I don't have much time. And, and also, um, many of these artists are going to be part of Plein Air Live and they'll be show you, showing you how they paint. So I want to show you paintings by uh, Peter Adams. Um, Peter is the president of the uh, California Art Club and he, he's a noted painter that, that does these gorgeous views of light, very intense colors at times and, and very powerful um, images and messages. This, there's a divine presence in, in Peter's work. This is by Clyde Aspervig. It's called Lightning Dance. Uh, one of our most interesting living artists. Clyde is, is a wonderful painter and he does these gorgeous views of, of the landscape and of the mountains. Um, just remarkable technique. Uh, Don Demers, who lives in Maine, uh, loves to paint boats, loves to paint the Maine coast. In this case, uh, it's called Cozy Harbor. And uh, again, the way he captures the light, how it reflects off the various surfaces. There's wood, there's water, um, there's metal, there's rocks, there's bushes, all handled very, very well. Just a remarkable painter. I, I, I really like Don Demers work. This is by Eric Koppel who is really like the Hudson River School uh, recreated. Uh, he is just as adept and just as as interested as the original Hudson River School painters. So um, he's, he's a wonderful artist and, and paints the, the very spiritual nature, paints a lot in, in the Hudson Valley and uh, Again, the same technique and the same approach, uh, very much in the Hudson River tradition. And I want to close with this beautiful sunset. This is an oil painting, it's not a photograph. It's by Joseph McGurl. And again, very much 
in what was happening in Hudson Valley 75, 100 years before. Um, light, distance, depth, smooth surface. Um, we have some really good artists that are going to be teaching us in, in this event in Plein Air Live. So thank you for attending my lecture. Uh, I hope you follow up and, and keep looking and uh, researching Hudson River painters. And when you see one, uh, take a close look at it. If you're in a museum, uh, see how it's done. Uh, marvel at the surface and at the, the powerful message of the light and of the nature that these artists were able to capture. So enjoy the rest of the uh, Plein Air Live and I'll see you soon. Take care.